So uh, thank you again so much, and uh, I hope you have been engaged and really learning a lot of throughout the first part of this day. Um, so on this panel, this is the community and courts bail implementation panel. Um, what we have are, uh, are among our esteemed panelists are practitioners and folks who are watching what's happening on the ground. So we've learned a lot about what the legislative intent ha was in preparing the statute and writing that statute, you know, this intent to lean on decarceration, reduce the number of people who are experiencing jails and prisons here in New York State, address wealth-based disparities, as well as begin to mitigate those racial and ethnic disparities that we see throughout our criminal justice system. Um, and we know that that intent, of course, gets reduced to text, um, and how that, that, that process happens uh, is, can be often cumbersome, right? There are some compromises that are made, there's language that is used in order to uh, codify these intentions. Um, we also learned from the research perspective, what are some of the outcomes we have seen throughout New York State in terms of the changes in the jail population, the use of bail, the amounts of bail. Um, and what we are hoping to turn to now is what does all this look like at the stage of implementation, right? What are the folks who are spending their time in court in arraignments, surrounding arraignments, um, watching from a community perspective, what does this mean in practice? And what are some of the challenges that have been experienced on the ground? So I'm very grateful to the panelists who are joining us this afternoon um, and thankful for all of you who have returned after lunch break. Um, so for what I, I also want to remind the audience, those who are watching remotely, those of you who are here, we're taking questions in a few ways. Uh, we have a Twitter account. <laughs> We're using Twitter with the hashtag NY Bail Conference. So if you feel like tweeting a question, please do. I have colleagues who will assist me in getting those questions. Uh, and we also obviously have this space and we will be taking questions directly from the audience. Um, so if, if anybody, at, we'll, we'll, we'll start with some discussion. We'll turn it over to all of you for some questions. Um, and just one note that DA stores may need to leave a bit early as our schedule um, is kind of running into each other, but uh, we, we are really thankful for his time as well as the time of all the panelists here. So um, I'm gonna go, I would like to introduce everyone. I'm gonna give a brief introduction um, starting from my left to my right so you all know who, you, who they are before they start speaking, okay. So um, I should say, I don't believe I introduced myself. My name is Crystal Rodriguez. I'm the policy director at the Data Collaborative for Justice um, here at John Jay. And immediately to my left is Martha Bailey. Martha is the executive director of the Wayne County Pretrial Services. Uh, we, ha we have Sarita Daftery, who is co-director of Freedom Agenda. Uh, Youngmi Lee, who is legal director of the criminal defense practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. And we have a Wiena Martinez, who is the former project director of the Staten Island Justice Center of the Center for Court Innovation. And the Honorable David Soares, uh, the Albany County District Attorney. So I would like to ask um, of you all just a general question to sort of give people a picture of what all these numbers and legislative texts translates into on the ground, right? So, and I'd like to start with DA Soares, if that's okay. Um, considering the goals of the law and what we've been learning about and discussing throughout the day, could you share um, from each of your perspectives, what about implementation has gone well, or what are some things you have observed as deficits or challenges to implementing this bail statute? Okay, uh, interesting question. <clears throat> So the only thing that I, the only way that I could relate the experience in, a, in what I think is a relatable way is when you're, uh, I'm an immigrant and you come to this country, you have your first Christmas and you get this box, this matchbox cars, it's box is beautiful. You open up all the toys and you realize 
batteries are not included, and there's some assembly required. <laughs> and so when you get, uh, when you get such transformational policy, um, well intended as I'm sure they, they were, there, there are no directions that come with it. And, and in this instance, neither was there any funding. And I think oftentimes, as it happens in Albany, whenever we have major policy shifts, those policies are often um, uh, developed with a New York City-centric perspective. In other words, I understand the George Washington Bridge, that there's a wall and the rest of us live north of the wall. If you're a Game of Thrones uh, fan, I think you might understand. And I, and I say that just because the ecology of our criminal justice system in upstate New York is much different than it is here in the city. So to give you an example, just in my jurisdiction of 300,000 people, we have the most diverse of, of, um, of, of communities. We have an inner city, we have, um, we have river towns, we have more rural um, hill towns, and we have you know, bedroom communities, all of whom, uh, all of which have a court system in, in each of those communities. In Albany County, as I'm sure um, in, in other upstate communities, the organization that is primarily responsible for pretrial services is probation. Um, unlike certain communities here in the city that have not-for-profits that, uh, um, uh, that, that, uh, that are responsible for pretrial services. I think what is interesting and something that we'll probably get to is determining whether there is a difference in, in pretrial services when uh, those services are offered by an institution that is, um, that is connected with the criminal justice system as opposed to one um, that, uh, that, that, that is in community and community-based. I think that's a, a relevant issue to, to study. Um, as I said, batteries not included and, and some assembly required. The, these transfer, just transformative programs did not come with funding. Upstate communities that also experience a 2% um, uh, tax cap um, are also challenged in, I think, providing the kind of services that perhaps others are experiencing here in, uh, in New York City. It would also be interesting to see whether there is a correlation between outcomes based upon um, based upon funding. Um, in New York, in Albany, New York, what we're experiencing now in the courts is as, as a rate of return. If you're talking about uh, our city court, which is open every day, um, and people have access to that courthouse every day, even for arraignments on the weekends, we're seeing a, a rate of return of about 50%. In our local courts, uh, we're seeing, in, in our town and village courts, we're seeing a return rate of about 25 to 30 percent. And, and what does that mean? Um, giving you an example of a community in my, uh, in my jurisdiction, Colony. In Colony, you have um, two courts and three judges, and they rotate, right? So their policy in Colony is uh, three strikes and then you'll get a failure to appear um, a warrant, right? Um, when you're on a rotating schedule, th those three strikes take nine weeks to achieve. So we're not seeing individuals back um, for months at a time. And then if they, they're not returning on that ninth week, you're, you're on that same rotation. Now, wh what does that mean? Well, that means for, for individuals who are presenting not only with a criminal charge, but also presenting with some other need, for example, uh, treatment, uh, which they can get connected to, um, they're, not, they're not receiving, they're not getting access um, to that treatment, um, which is an issue. And I'm interested in hearing how other communities are, are uh, wrestling um, with those issues. I was told, um, with very threatening eyes uh, on a Zoom call that this was not going to be a discussion about opinions as to whether bail reform was a good thing or a bad thing, so I'm sticking to my script under the threat of harm. Uh, <laughs> but, but, I would, but I would leave you with this. I would leave you with this. Um, it's not just enough that, that there's advocacy for change in criminal justice policy. There has to be advocacy to make sure that there is support 
if you want those policies to succeed. And I think one of the challenges that we're experiencing north of the wall is um, these programs succeed. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with uh, uh, just the woeful funding um, for, for an investment towards success. I agree with, with, with people who say that people whose needs are being met are, are not out there committing harm to other people. Um, and I think right now we have the same condition uh, pre-existing bail reform where people's needs are not being met. Um, and so we have to figure out how to address that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Martha, I'd like to turn to you to focus on that general question around the deficits or challenges or, or maybe things that have been going well in implementation. Um, but with with the additional focus of zeroing in on something um, DA Source just shared regarding the support needed for policies to succeed. What is um, not just the financial support that those policies need, but what are the specific ways those resources would be directed in order to um, address whatever challenges or deficits you might share? <laughs> so I'm from a county where there's around 90,000 people. <laughs> we are a very rural county. Um, where we are a completely community-based agency and nonprofit, we are not part of probation, our relationships within the criminal justice system is very important with all the stakeholders there. Our relationships with the human services agencies is essential. Um, and then our relationships with the individuals that are getting placed on release is um, Ba it helps our success, quite frankly. Um, I was here earlier and there was a sheriff who spoke on, he knows the people that he's arresting. We know the people that are getting placed on release and there's a trust that all of those people place on us. Um, along with that, it is, you know, we were expected to do a lot more with the same amount of funding and that proved to be a huge challenge. Um, we have very little transportation. That's a huge challenge, is trying to figure out how are people even gonna get to court. Um, when it was virtual, how are they even going to attend court virtually if they don't have access to the internet or access to a cell phone? Um, those are things that we had to face on a very limited budget. Um, we use technology a lot, but one of our biggest strengths, I think, is how to make it a human interaction with the people that we're helping. Um, we're able to give them access to services that could, in reality, be life-changing for them. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. That was very helpful. So some of the things that I'm hearing is that the, the relationships is what allowed you to sort of build on to, like build in the implementation, right? Like you were able to connect people to services because you had these pre-existing connections with community service providers. Um, I, I would like to turn to Awina, uh, who uh, is former director of Santa Island Justice Center, oversaw supervised release here in New York City. Um, and what I would like to ask you is, what are some of the challenges you saw and how did you overcome them as it relates to this service provision, right? This ability to connect people to, directly to the service they might need. Um, and I'm gonna tackle on another question. What, what, what are the services you think are most needed, most prevalent in the folks who you're seeing coming through your program? Yeah, so first, and. Foremost, you know, we, we talk about data and numbers and, and the intent of the law and behind every number is a person, a person, you know, with needs, with their own story, who's tied to community, with family. Um, and so, I mean, a really big obvious answer to that is funding and resources. So um, the Staten Island Justice Center and the Center for Court Innovation had been operating supervised release programming since 2016. Um, it was operating on a smaller scale. There were eligibility requirements. So we had four or five years of, of 
experience under our belt servicing the Staten Island community. We always said that supervised release, the whole point is to get people back to court, but it's so much more. It can be so much more. And so when the bail reform um, legislation um, happened, you know, our resources increased. We received more funding to hire more social workers and case managers. Um, at the time, 2019, we had a very small team of four or five people um, who were working with our, our clients every day, providing them with resource allocation, um, even something simple as, you know, I, I have a case manager who I can call and, and, and just talk to. You know, that, that human-centered approach, that human touch was really important for someone who was going through a very difficult time in their lives. And so um, with the expansion in, in bail reform, we were, we, our, our funding increased. And so we were allowed to uh, increase- She's hating on you over there. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the goal, right? The goal is to increase resources across the state of New York because we went from a team of four, five, six people to over 30 in a matter of three years. And um, that allowed people to have smaller caseloads, um, more attention paid. They're able to catch um, any any specific needs that someone is, is, is coming to us with. So I would say that the, the biggest answer to that is really us having the ability to hire more staff mm -hmm. so that we could have more of this human-centered approach, you know, and if someone's need is just, I'm going to call once a month because that's what my supervision level requires and it's all I need, that's okay. But like I said, it was return to court, but it can be so much more. So providing resources, um, if someone needed diapers or formula for their baby, we provided that um, when the the court shut down due to the pandemic um, and we had to go to video court. We had to provide, we were able to provide phones, smartphones, you know, so resources really went a long way. And I would really say that um, you would think a pandemic would affect compliance. Our compliance got better during that remote period. Could, could I ask a follow-up question, Awina? Speaking of um, your caseloads, right? How did you expect caseloads to change given what was written into the statute? And then what did you actually witness and observe um, in terms of the caseload? Any characteristics of the folks who were coming through the program? Yes, so prior to bail reform, uh, there was an eligibility cutoff. You know, if you rated high risk on an assessment, you were not eligible for supervised release. So with the expansion of charges, there was no eligibility criteria. We were hoping and we were anticipating seeing more fel felony level charges coming in through supervised release so that misdemeanor level uh, uh, offenses could could be ROR'd and we would have more of the resources and time to really work with those folks um, coming in through the system. And so we did see an uptick in felony releases in two th at the tail end of 2019 when we did launch um, the new version of supervised release. Uh, but that slowly kind of trickled down. I think the excitement or the, the judicial kind of um, pressure to, to release people out of Rikers, you know, um, this supervised release program is here, I will utilize it now. Um, so that did attribute to a, a, an increase in felony um, releases to us. However, throughout the year, um, the past two years, we've kind of seen more of what we used to get. It's just kind of like 60%, 40% misdemeanor majority caseload. So a lot of our folks that were coming in were coming in on misdemeanor offenses and it continues to, to be that kind of um, breakdown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just following up on that, I'd like to turn to Young Me. You know, um, Awina notes this uh, change or this shift in the folks who are being sent to the supervised release program. And so from your experience, um, why might that be? What what is contributing to that? And um, you know how how might that be um, an implementation challenge for for this bail statute? Sure. So um, Brooklyn um, was an outlier jurisdiction in all of New York City since supervised release occurred in 2016. So and this was pre bail reform. Uh, and we were the outlier because we had many more misdemeanor cases on supervised release than on felony cases. And so it seemed that with judges, even though cases were eligible for supervised release, they would rather set money bail on the felonies. Uh, whereas on the misdemeanors, they were more likely to do supervised release. And so there was a real concern that people who should have just gotten straight release 
without any conditions, were getting supervised release anyway. And so we were very concerned about that over-programming, over-supervision of people who are presumed innocent. Um, so Brooklyn uh, was like that for years, and then we had bail reform. And the hope was, because pretrial services in New York City, we call it supervised release, pretrial services is the generic name, supervised release is the name of the program in New York City. Um, and so every case, no matter how violent the felony, is eligible for pretrial services. Um, and if judges are applying the least restrictive standard, which is the new standard under the bail reform laws, you would expect to see an increase in the number of cases, whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor, getting supervised release. Um, and we're not really seeing that difference. Um, and I think part of the problem is, is that uh, when we're talking about whether bail reform is a success or not, What's really important to keep in mind is that for decades, we all, and I'm, as a defense attorney, we all caused a lot of harm with the bail laws, not just on individuals' lives, that person with the 30 misdemeanor convictions who kept pleading guilty just to get out of jail um, because bail was set on a petty larceny, but also on, on whole communities. And so the expectation that we got this amazing bail uh, reform, and it is amazing, it was, mon it was really transformational throughout the country. Um, the expectation that we would have overnight success was, it's really unrealistic. And, and so what happened was we had the fear mongering and I'm sure it was all discussed this morning. And even before we could try to measure a little bit of success, we had rollbacks. Right, so in 2020, even before implementation could take place, the legislature, the governor, they scaled back some of the bail reform without evidence, without data. And then unfortunately the pandemic hit and those who are without money, who need the services the most, were hit the hardest by the pandemic. And even pretrial services, supervised release, they had to go into a virtual um, supervision, which we all know when it comes to the one-on-one -on -one counseling and the face-to-face -face encounters for people who really need services, that that is not going to be as effective. So we have the pandemic, the people who are hit the hardest by the pandemic, their lives are even more upturned. And, and then again, we're trying to measure the success of bail reform given these harsh conditions that are happening across the country, not just in New York State, but across the country. And we're still trying to measure success. And then we get to 2022, where we're scaling back bail reform again. And again, it was so clear, so, so very clear that there was no data to back up what was happening um, in, in terms of whether bail reform was working, whether it was really affecting public safety, um, and, and the conversation just turned south again um, based on a nationwide epidemic. Um, and so when we're talking about implementation and whether judges, and I have to say, there are plenty of judges in Brooklyn who are using all the tools that are within the bail reform statutes. So we have judges who are really taking seriously the partially secured bond option. We even have a couple of judges who will, and I would love to see this happen more, the unsecured bond for those bail eligible cases where judges feel that bail should be used as an incentive to bring someone back to court, right? Because that's what bail is about. Or utilizing maybe pretrial services more. And I think part of the problem with pretrial services and why it might not be, uh, why it's not being utilized more, especially on the qualifying offenses, where instead of bail, judges should be using pretrial services, is that maybe there's a misunderstanding about pretrial services, which in New York City is pretty robust. We have supervised release. There's an intimate partner violence component to it. They do voluntary referrals. People don't realize that some people who need services but don't want a court mandate and don't want to be forced into treatment are availing themselves of the, of the voluntary referral services. 
um, and going and doing services quietly on their own. And we have actually had lawyers who will say, oh, you know, my client's doing pretrial services, they're doing well, they're doing their weekly check-ins, or if they're on the least level of supervision, their monthly check-ins. But guess what? They're also doing a program on their own, and now I'm going to use that to get a plea disposition on the case for those who want to plead guilty. Um, and so there's no coercion, there's no use of bail to force people into pleading guilty so that they build up a record of having 30 convictions on really low level offenses. Um, and I think when you look at these individual cases, that's how you mark success. Overall, the big picture, when you're looking at data, I think it's gonna take a while to measure true success if you're looking at large numbers. Um, but in terms of individual lives, those who don't go to Rikers, many of them are doing really well. Zia, sir, should I give you a... Uh, well, yeah, uh, because I, I think I... <laughs> I couldn't disagree with you more on some of the things that you said. I think if I think we can all be in agreement here and talk about the need for additional services. I think this idea that that we're not seeing an increase in crime because of what's happened with bail is absurd. Now I don't practice law in Kings County. I practice law in Albany County. And when you talk about numbers, I, I mean. I don't understand what you're talking about when we have people who are released that otherwise would not have been released reoffending. But I don't want to get into the debates of whether or not there's reason to roll back or not. I think we should be joining together and calling for our leadership to call for research and studies and testimonies and, and allow for every jurisdiction to come forward and present th their information and then be able to assess whether or not something is working. because. When you say we don't have numbers and there's no evidence, well, I have evidence in my office. I have evidence in my office of people who are committing atrocious crimes, being released and, 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 and doing more harm. And it's concentrated in, in one community. And so the question then becomes, should we, how long do we have to ask black and brown communities to continue enduring the suffering of violence because we want to establish that, that reform and, and, and equity is a good thing. I, I'm not going to get into the, the, the merits of, of whether it's a good or bad thing, because I said that I wouldn't do that and distract the conversation from, from uh, the, the desperate need for resources so that everyone is operating at a Staten Island level. But I, I think it's incumbent upon us to ask the leaders who pass the legislation to, to in this next term, um, to, to come to Albany with, with the idea and the thought and plan to, to have a greater discussion. And so, could I, oh, uh, sorry, I just wanted to uh, bring uh, Sarita Daftery into the conversation. I know that you are doing work that uh, is connected to individuals who are most directly impacted by um, the bail reform law, court practices, judicial decision-making. Um, what, from, from your perspective, what are some maybe pitfalls of, of how implementation has been going? What, or what are some strengths, if, there any, if there's any that you've observed, um, of how implementation has been going? Thank you, and it's uh, hard not to jump into that, but I'll, I'll try to respond to, uh, to what you said. And um, I am the, the co-director of Freedom Agenda. We're a membership group, so um, our members are folks who have been incarcerated on Rikers, who are, whose loved ones have been or are incarcerated now. Um, and so I would say that a lot of what we're seeing is actually um, certainly what we see as the deficits and challenges in terms of the people who are still there and, and all of the ways that judges are still using their ample discretion to incarcerate. Um, what we are seeing is that uh, bail, un unaffordable bail is still being set. And that seems um, really obvious. That's maybe not like a news flash to anybody, but maybe we should pause a second and on what that is. So people are still being held in jail, in New York City, a jail that has been called by a federal monitor and its own oversight board a deadly, dangerous place and where 20 people have died in the past year and a half, people are still there rather than home awaiting their trial while they are presumed innocent because they didn't have enough money. 
So if that was happening one time, that would be too much. It is happening thousands of times over, and that's, that's the situation we're in. So that's what we're seeing. Um, the, what, what we're seeing through the lived experience of our members includes, um, I feel like every, every piece of what we've talked about today in terms of um, the, the ways in which the intent of the law is being skirted. Um, so let me give a couple of examples. Um, one of our members who uh, her son is, is, has been on Rikers for the past two and a half years, um, struggles with mental illness, is had his bail set at 75,000 cash and 250,000 partially secured bond, was not able to pay either, and has been so distressed in the, the environment in Rikers Island where his mental health has deteriorated um, that he has not been, he's not made it to his past several court dates. Of course, this is Rikers Island, so nobody really knows if corrections failed to transport him or if he refused because he was having a mental health episode. But um, so his, you know, so, so that, that his time there is being dragged out even further. Um, another example uh, that I would say is the, uh, the use of the, the way in which um, people are still blocked from treatment courts, and treatment courts are already not the ideal, right? Like you don't want people to have to get arrested <laughs> to go get services. But if people have been identified in the process of uh, an arrest and, you know, and come into the court system with a clear need for services and for treatment, you wanna be able to divert them. But still we see, um, because the current statute allows prosecutors to, to act as the gatekeeper, we still see some prosecutors uh, slamming the door on people who need treatment. And so we have a member who uh, has a case right now. Her, her, uh, the judge in that case actually has said uh, that he's very open to an alternative, very open to treatment. There's a clear need. They did an evaluation. It seems like there's a clear need for treatment, um, an intensive treatment for her son. Um, but the, the prosecutor just won't, won't consent to the case moving to treatment court. And so he remains on Rikers, um, exposed to more and more violence every day. And uh, I think the people have some sense of the environment on Rikers, but it's, it's an environment that requires violence in a sense. Like people who are not, people need to be prepared to defend themselves. And so the way in which that perpetuates violence um, is completely counter to, you know, to public safety. Um, and certainly that's what we're hearing from our members. Um, we're also seeing that um, the, we, we've been looking a lot at the way that judges are implementing bail reform, basically because we, we, want, we want to know, like, you know, we want to know how this is being implemented, but also because judges are going to continue to have some discretion. I mean, like, the, the whole bail reform fight has been about, like, how much discretion they have over which cases, and, you know, in, in, in certain ways, but, but we're not near a system where judges have no discretion, so we are interested in seeing how, to judge, how are judges using that discretion. And we started looking into it more in... Um, probably around July, the summer of 2020, um, when in response to concerns about the spread of COVID in jails, there was, there was like a wave of willingness to release. And, it, and what happened was that, you know, people who were serving short, short sentences were released. Um, people with uh, being held for, for accused of parole violations were released. And then we were sort of looking at like, what's next and what's left. And it was, it was all pretrial detention. And it was clear that in, in that case, like all, it was all judges, you know, like the people that were going to uh, make the difference in whether a person was going to get out or that, at that point um, and be able to be you know, in a safer setting, not in a congregate setting during COVID was all judges. Um, and we, we wanted to at least like engage in that conversation about what is influencing judges <laughs> because I think the, uh, we sort of, felt like the, the common knowledge is that judges are like immune to public pressure. They're supposed to be these like removed figures. Um, but what seemed more the case was that they were actually responding to the wrong pressure, that they were, you know, sort of uh, acting out of a desire not to be named in the New York Post, um, rather than really thinking about how am I applying a law that requires me to use the least restrictive conditions um, that requires that I at least consider ability to pay, which you can't do if you're not assessing ability to pay, and neither of those are happening. Um, 
And then, you know, that, that, that restricts me to looking at um, this per, a, a person's likelihood of return to court. Um, and what we see is, is not that. It's that uh, repeatedly, you know, bail amounts and decisions about release, they're really based on the charge. And so when they are based on the charge, that is, that's a stand-in for dangerousness. So it's not, we don't have a legal statute of dangerousness, but we have, we have judges, you know, sort of informally and I would say, you know, aside, you know outside of the law using dangerousness all the time. Um, and if we were serious about wanting safety, that's, that there's, there isn't data to back that up. You know, people accused of the most serious crimes are in some ways like the least likely to, you know, to be rearrested when they're, when they're out pending that case. Um, and, and we have ample evidence um, before us in, in many, many stories, but even within our membership, of people who are wrongfully convicted. So, you know, I, I think it's something for us all to think about. And, you know, it's like, at, as a society, could we, can we accept the idea that a very serious, the accusation of a very serious charge or very serious harm, is that enough for all the protections of the presumption of innocence to go out the window? Because it feels like, and what our members have experienced is like, that's, you know, that's the case. You get, you are charged with murder and therefore we cannot possibly release you pending your trial. So you have to try to prove your innocence while you're stuck on Rikers and then you get convicted and you know, exonerated 25 years later, having lost those, those 25 years. Um, so I guess to, to wrap up, I'll just say, I, I, uh, I had the experience a few years ago of um, going to South Africa and while there visiting a, a prison with, with someone who had been incarcerated at that prison. And we had the oddest conversation where we, we realized like we couldn't, our, our ways of talking out about bail like were really <laughs> dissonant because they, they were sort of treated bail as a thing you pay. It, like they were talking about it in a positive way as sort of like, well, like I was so scared the judge wouldn't set bail. And we were like, what? <laughs> and they, what they meant was that they were scared. They were scared of remand being, you know, sort of this other possibility, but that bail was like a thing you pay. And I think that, um, you know, we in, in the US and certainly in New York, and I, I can't speak for, you know, elsewhere, but have an experience where people are talking about, you know, the, clearly our you know collective experience about bail when we talk about it is a thing you don't pay a thing that a thing that holds you in and you know there's been some debate today about whether or not people should be held in or not but the idea that that um, that bail is remand is sort of like the default that we're operating from and so I think that continues to be a deficit in the implementation um, and you highlighted a few different things and I think there's some something to say about the use of jails and what people experience while there. And it was pretty clear that the legislative intent was to create alternatives, right? To say um, mandatory, you know, most cases, people charged with virtually most nonviolent felonies and misdemeanors would be subject to a release with the understanding that instead of jail, you could use alternatives to uh, uh, incarceration, sorry. Um, you know, where steps in some of these pre-trial services that we're talking about. Another thing that was um, included in the statute, at least upon when it was revisited in 2020, was this use of mandatory programming, right? It became something that courts could explicitly order for the folks who appear before them, the accused individuals. They had this option to say, while you are released, waiting for your, your trial, um, you can participate, you, where I'm ordering you to participate in some sort of program that meets some sort of need, right, of that individual. And what I would like to ask is how, you know, there seems to be consensus amongst the folks here, right? We talked about the human interaction. We talked about, you know, supervised release and so much more, right, and linking people to these things. How have you, and I'll, I'm, I'm sort of giving this to anyone who feels comfortable responding, is how have you seen that particular part of the statute used? And then maybe share, you know, what about that has been going well or, or, or not? So um, one thing that's clear, just looking at the Rikers population, and I'm sorry that I can't speak for, for the rest of the state, um, the Rikers population has a minimum of 60% of the population has a diagnosed mental illness. And that's, I'm not talking about people who have never been diagnosed. 
So we are mass incarcerating people who have a mental illness, who have clearly fallen through the cracks. And unfortunately, many of them are dying at Rikers Island. Um, so the last death, which was less than a week ago, was a suicide. Um, and, and so I do think the legislature, uh, especially with the 2022 um, amendments, recognized that um, there is mental illness um, that is going, uh, issues that are being unaddressed in the criminal system, and I can't call it the criminal justice system, but in the criminal system. And um, so just with the one amendment to CPL 510, there was, a, there was a reminder to judges. And one of the most important reminders is, as a condition of release, a judge can send someone to a treatment court or to a court for judicial diversion, which is under Article 216 of the Criminal Procedure Law. And that's for, right now, it's for substance use disorders. Uh, hopefully, it will expand into, uh, uh, some people have a mental illness and they don't have the substance use uh, component also. Um, but the, it's, it's a recognition that people who are mentally ill, the fallback and the default should not be jail. Um, but what's very clear for those who have a serious mental illness diagnosis also is that many of them don't have supportive housing or they've lost it. Um, and so there, there are issues with resources. Uh, and I'm not saying that it's easy to treat someone with a, a mental illness. And, and this is just for someone who doesn't even have a criminal case pending. But when you add on the criminal case that's pending and you send them to a place like Rikers Island, even on a misdemeanor, they're gonna come out worse. So many people decompensate when they're at Rikers Island. So if eventually um, the case gets dismissed because of 30-30 or because the complainant's uncooperative or they get an acquittal, they come out and they're far worse. They've decompensated. I mean, I was just looking at a file today, this morning. This man has been requesting ment a mental health visit and DOC is not producing them, right? They are cut off from their psychiatric medication even though Correctional Health Services has, has acknowledged that there's a psychiatric illness and that this person needs psychiatric medication and he's not being produced. So when we're talking about why are we sending people to Rikers Island on, on, on charges where they might eventually get an acquittal or it's a misdemeanor, they might eventually get a three-month jail sentence because it's, it's a misdemeanor and the DA sees that that's the value of the case. Um, and, and so what happens then is we just continue with the cycle. We continue with the cycle. And with the 2022 reforms, there's another reminder to judges, you can have pretrial services assist with, if someone has to go to the hospital for, under the mental hygiene law, 943, for an observation and evaluation, you can use pretrial services uh, to assist with that. Mm -hmm. But it's a real recognition that this is a problem and that courts should really, at a minimum, pause before they just uh, default and send someone to jail. Could, Martha, do you? So for us, we've had that aspect of um, as part of our supervision as a mental health uh, counseling or substance abuse counseling and that we monitor that, we make sure that they get involved in the program. A lot of it is scary for the individual to even make that phone call, we assist in making that. Um, but the judges have been utilizing that in Wayne County for over 20 years. Um, and they acknowledge that there are other barriers that, af that affect a person's life. Um, and if they can get that help, then they very much are open to using that. Um, right now, it's probably 10% of our cases have that as part of it. Um, the other ones that are certainly the release with the lowest conditions, um, if they're 
if we are in talking to that person, um, even they feel that those issues need to be addressed, we certainly help them do that. And it really affects the success of their case, but the success of their life, really. One of the, one, one of the things that I, I truly enjoy, uh, I, I really enjoy listening to the success stories of people um, who otherwise would have not experienced success in their lives, uh, but for, but for like your program and, and the program that you are uh, talking about in Wayne County. And I remember during a lot of the debates and discussions about um, pretrial services and how, I mean, there was a statistic that was presented during the discussions at the Capitol about how 80 plus percent of the people, if provided with good pretrial services, will return um, to court. And there is no dispute disputing that. I believe that. I, I believe if there's someone who's on that phone, who's attending to the needs of, of people, whether those needs be direct needs or other familial needs, um, I, I do believe that you're going to get cooperation. I do believe that you're going to get positive outcomes. But I think we, we, if we're really serious about pushing this state forward and, and, and having you know, the best systems in, in the country, then we just have to stop rewarding our elected officials with the simple passage of things when they're not funding those things. Because you might have a robust system in New York City, but that's not the case in 57 other counties, which is why 57 other counties have to struggle to, to come into compliance and do the best that they can. Can it be better? Absolutely, yes. I've been living at the bottom of the hill from the state capitol uh, for over 20 years. And it's one unfunded mandate after another, forcing local municipalities to struggle to comply with those unfunded mandates. Um, but, if, but if we're serious about change, about reform, then it's not just, hey, here's the signing of the piece of legislation. And by the way, signing a piece of legislation without also <laughs> writing a check, um, it, it's called palm card reform. They can talk about it in their next campaign for re-election, but they're not really serious about it. Because if they were serious about it, they'd invest in people. Okay. Okay. I just want to um, remind folks that we're in a few minutes, um, I'm going to open it up for Q&A. Um, so if anyone wants to tweet a question or just wants to think through what you would like to ask, just giving a, a few minutes warning. Um, Sarita, did you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that... Um what you touched on in terms of the the need to the need to fund the services that are required, whether they're attached to a law or the, because they've been needed for you know for decades, um, absolutely. And where the I think where some disingenuousness and uh, from the some of the most vocal opposition is is exposed is that it's the same people who were um, sort of most ready to pounce on a bail reform as the boogeyman have been trying to defund social services for the last and succeeded for the last several decades so we you know so there's th that is true and it is also um questionable then why the response to saying uh bail reform you know there were there were things needed in addition to bail reform why that would then go to uh weaken bail reform or put more things back in the bail eligible bucket rather than invest in services because if the, i think if all the energy had been let's invest in services, that would have been a very different discussion. We would have come out of a, out with a budget that left bail reform intact and funneled like, you know, a, a respectable amount of money into services that could possibly compete with like what we have invested in, in law enforcement over the last many, many years. And just to give, I mean, an, an example of this, I think that in, in New York City, and we recognize that New York City is, you know, is not the only city in this state and is an outlier in certain ways, but it has. It serves as an example that New York City's jail population has been declining, with you know some ticks up and down around COVID that were non-typical, but um, has been declining for 25 years. Is 75% of what it was 25 years ago, and we left 
all of that money in corrections. They did not lose a dollar. And so, yes, are people still struggling? And there, there's a gap in services? Yes, because nobody's had the political will to say, we don't need all those correction officers. And so instead, you know, the, what, we, what would have been really positive would be that people, people were struggling and we weren't seeing it because we could just hide them in jail. Now people are still struggling and we're seeing it more on the streets because it's harder to hide them in jail. And so the response then needs to be, how do we get that money? Back, you know, and it's not that we don't have money. <laughs> we, I mean, in New York City, certainly, I will, I will speak for, for the city that I live in, we have money. It is about the willingness to shift it from where it is not needed to where it's needed. Okay. Um, I, I, I would like to open it up, give an opportunity for um, either people here in the room with us to ask questions if anyone has a question on their mind for one or all of our panelists. Um, and for those who are maybe watching remotely, feel free to, to use the Twitter handle NY Bail Conference if you'd like to ask your question that way. Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep asking questions because I do have a few. Um, I will say, you know, I wonder, I wonder, you know, there's this big this conversation around resources, right? And I'm hearing an infrastructure that is supportive of social services, right? So this is where those dollars would go. Are there any other hard, concrete, as specific as you can get examples of where such dollars would go? I also heard from Awina's earlier comment about just sheer number of people to supervise the larger number of people who are now on supervision awaiting their trial. So any other concrete examples that you all can, can share? Sorry, if you want to go away. <laughs> I don't want to, I'll go after you and me because I just spoke. <laughs> uh, I think housing is uh, incredibly important because I think when judges see on someone's CJA form that the person um, doesn't have stable housing, uh, the fallback is jail. Um, and that, that is just completely, it's illogical to me, but that's what a lot of judges do. Um, I think supportive housing for those with the mental illness, um, we really need resources there. I mean, supporting ha supportive housing uh, is, is incredibly important because I think once you, once you have a physically safe place to live, right? Because I, I, I've represented plenty, I, I represented a young man who had um, agoraphobia. And so, you know, and just like being in a crowded setting. Um, so I, I think um, stable housing is, is important. And then obviously, you know, the mental health services, um, more job opportunities. But these are all very difficult for people who've been incarcerated, whether it's intermittent or not, um, who, um, who don't have the stability in their lives anyway. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, as a public defender, and I was in private practice, but as a public defender, what we see the most is people who have, who have lengthy uh, criminal conviction records. And I've had that discussion I see a couple of public defenders here. I've had that discussion pre-bail reform on misdemeanor cases where someone will say, I want to fight this case, but bail is set. They can't even make $750 bail. And they say, it's better for me to plead guilty, to take the 30 days rather than wait a year to go to trial on a misdemeanor. And that's how you keep building up, right, that record. Um, and, and so that, that's the harm that I think is going to take a long time to undo. Um, because you have this one individual who's taken out of his or her community, right? And all of a sudden a child loses a parent, right? Or uh, a mother loses a son who's helping with medical assistance or whatever it is. And that one person can have such an impact within that community. Um, and this is what happened pre-bail reform. A and then you build up, um, you know, pretty much a damaged record and, um, and and this is what we as defenders and ad, as advocates have been talking about in terms of why bail reform was so necessary and why mass decarceration really has to end um, because it's just 
it's the one person, but the impact is, is huge. Sarita, did you, oh, sorry. I was gonna go back to Sarita to give oh, her an opportunity. I just wanna quickly um, just, just double down on the supportive housing, increasing options, especially in a borough like Staten Island where the options are very limited and also accessible mental health services, um, efficient, quick mental health services, just from a pre-trial services uh, perspective or experience, we'll get someone on, you know, released to us and then, you know, they have a high level of, of, of mental health um, diagnoses or present a certain way in, in our office. At times that it's been violent and then we find out that, you know, a day later they're arrested in another jurisdiction, in another borough, and then three days later they're arrested again. So it goes back to the earlier comment around, you know, what is needed for people to who who exhibit these um, these behaviors and have these 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 this illness, you know, having access so that the person is prevented from, you know, being rearrested. They that person obviously needed help and they needed quick access to help, um, but kept getting arrested and is in Rikers right now on remand. And and I do know that that person does have severe mental health issues that are likely going. Um, untreated and, and not taken care of. Uh, if I can ask the question, and I'm just curious because I find this, I find this aspect of the conversation fascinating. You're, in New York City, when people are, are, are arrested on, um, it, it could be like disorderly conduct offenses or petty offenses, they're receiving desk appearance tickets, right? Is that? Many, many of them are. Oh. Um, as long as they fit the statutory criteria, so. So, so when are, are they are, are they connected to services at a, upon arraignment when they're because your your pretrial services are they being connected then and there? Well, pretrial services can't be ordered yes. until a judge orders it yep. as a condition of release, um, and so we're back to the twenty day arraignment mm -hmm. period on a, on appearance tickets. Uh, the Brooklyn DA has a pre-arraignment diversion program, um, and so if people want to avoid getting their case even docketed after the arrest, uh, they can sign up for a program so that they don't even have a docketed case, and then the case is over as long as they do whatever it is uh, that's required of them. But if they do come through arraignments on an appearance ticket, um, just because it's an appearance ticket eligible offense, meaning it's most likely a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, supervised release is not utilized because it would just be too much and yeah. overkill for that type uh, of person who probably has never been arrested before. Could, but, we could I, I, I wanted to give an opportunity because we have a few minutes left to, I believe we have an audience member who does have a question Yes, good afternoon. This question is for Josh Soros. I know that you stated that you are not that you are not um, going to speak about the issue as to is bail reform good or bad, but I have I have heard you outside of the sentence complaining that bail reform is creating more crime in your community. Now, um all the data, data that we've seen before you spoke here, and all the data, data that um, that the leaderships in the Senate and the leadership in the Assembly, who was reluctant to to to, to um, roll back bail reform, is contrary to everything that you stated about bail reform. Like it cre it creates more crime. You know what I'm saying. So my question to you, like, do you like? to have everybody who you accuse of a crime to be in jail because it's easier for you to um, to prosecute them because normally when they're in your custody, it's harder for them to defend themselves. Study shows that when somebody is out of jail fight, fighting for their, for, you know, fighting a trial, they have more, more chances of succeeding than to be in the jail. And that's why you have individuals who sometimes you are labeled as career criminals when they're not career criminals. 
the, like the council said, council stated that there's people that simply take the 30 days or they simply take the year because they don't want to spend years. And let me tell you, I was in Rikers Island back in the 1990s where people was getting stabbed in their neck and in the eye and losing arms and it was terrible. It's not good to be in those type of position, especially for individuals that got a misdemeanor. So like, what's the purpose of you like wanting individuals to stay in prison when the vast majority of them do not pose a real risk. Like all of those people is not killers. They don't kill people. They don't have like, I understand that certain really serious cases may require for them to stay in jail until the outcome. Even though I don't believe in the system that, that, that you all got in place, but like, what's the purpose? And the next thing, what are you doing about wrongful conviction? I never hear any district attorney complaint. Every month we see a wrongful conviction in the news, in the New York Times, in New York State. And no, none of y'all complain and say, this is wrong. Prosecutors should not be behaving like that. They should not be withholding its culpatory evidence. Y'all don't complain about that. All y'all complain about is incarcerating the individuals, and I want to know why. Uh, the name's David Soros, but if George Soros was my father, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, w the reason I stated, it, and I intentionally stated, that I wasn't here to engage in discussions as to whether bail is, is, is a good thing or bail is a bad thing, because that wasn't the point of us being here today. I was not on that panel. The point of us is being here now is to discuss the complexity of implementation bail, of bail reform and what, what's the temperature out there, what is necessary, um, what's good and what's bad. That was the, the context of the discussion. So that's why I'm here. Because I could, I could give you 100 reasons why, why, why this process is harmful, right? I can give you a hundred reasons. You're going to give me some studies that the Senate and the Assembly conducted to tell me why I'm wrong. But you're going to tell me why I'm wrong when I'm going to work every day and I walk through the same doors, I take the same elevator to the fourth floor, and I'm meeting with my staff in the morning, and here's a person who's committed a violent crime the week before, and he's been out on bail, and he's back again that morning because of another crime. And you're sitting here looking at me, putting your hand up like that, telling me what? If he's out on bail, why does it have anything to do with? Because the biggest misconception about bail reform is this idea that, well, he had bail set. Except that the, the finer point that you seem to miss is that that bail is set to an amount that they can afford. So if you're telling me that bail in Albany County is traditionally been set traditionally as it had been. I'm going to ask you how much time you spent in Albany County. And by the way, the other thing about discussions on this subject matter, which makes it a little difficult, I don't practice law in Kings County. I don't practice law in Manhattan. I practice in Albany County. So when there are generalized statements about the experiences of people in Rikers Island, that's not the experience in Albany County. That's not the experience in Washington County. And so I think we have to be responsible and, and, and say that when something isn't working, I can tell you what's working in my community and I can tell you what's not working in my community. Here's my point, okay? And I've said this publicly. Had, did we need to change our system? Has, did our system need to evolve? Yeah, our system needed to evolve, okay? Over 20 years ago, when I first ran, I was running against people who believed that anyone who was doing drugs should be locked up and sent to prison for 20, 25 years. You know, the, the, the criminal justice policies of ideologues in 2004 was harmful for 75 blocks in Albany County because that's the people, those are the people that were being arrested every single day, sent to prison, and, and, and disproportionately punished. And they look like me, they look like you. That's why I decided to get involved. So my criticisms of the current state of affairs with these reforms, okay? These reforms with people who are taking shots uh, 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 at, at, at people on a Sunday 
when that individual is back out on the street on Tuesday, guess what? You've gone from one person taking shots to people taking shots in the same community. So we've had an increase in the number of, of, of gun violence incidents. So if I could just uh, hold, hold on. I, I, oh, I want to respond. We I want to respond, OK? So now when I see the pendulum swinging and I see policies that are, that are presenting greater instances of violence in my community, guess what? I'm going to talk about that. The one searing question that I've had in my head when I'm listening to, to different people speak, and by the way, I respect everyone's perspective, OK? I respect everyone's perspective. You speak of people in Rikers Island, and the question that always comes to my mind is, what did they do to get there? Was someone harmed? And why aren't we talking about that person being harmed? Right? So, listen. So you assume public so I, I public wanna, safety. Sorry, I just want to make one. So, so one Island, thing that. I didn't say that. What I'm saying yeah, is, what? no, what I'm saying is, when people are talking about all of the, and I believe that there are atrocities at Rikers Island, I believe that there's harmful things that occur in corrections. That's not just limited to, to the city, that's, that's everywhere, right? And so I'm one of those prosecutors that I think uh, real, real carefully about the decision to send someone to prison. I have more off ramps from the criminal justice system in my office than any other office in this state. And I'm proud of that because I've been building that capacity for over 20 years, okay? But here's the thing. What I, what I cannot accept is this idea that, oh, okay, we're, we're gonna change, we're gonna change bail. We're also gonna change discovery. So now that someone who's harmed me, who lives two blocks down the road from me is going to have access to my information within weeks of arraignment. Is but that I, sensible <laughs> policy to you? Most so I really appreciate. They know each other. Most of the time they know each other. And so what you want to do, you want to keep the system so that the prosecutor could, could do trial by answers so, and give the defendant. No, what I, what I want so to do really, is make sure that. We really that the appreciate the conversation no. that is taking place. <laughs> oh, we know we are talking about a story that affects real humans, right? This is just not a text on a statute somewhere written up in Albany. This is, these are people coming through the system who are directly impacted. And that's why it's so important that these conversations be based on evidence, be based on data, and that policies be generated based on what we know. And so I want to thank our panelists for offering their perspective. I want to thank our audience for being very participatory. Um, and I'd like to, um, I don't think we're taking a break. At this okay, we're going to take a five minute break. We really mean five minutes. We have a great panel coming up in just five minutes on racial disparities and bail reform, the thing that has been threaded throughout our conversation today, but is going to get clear focus in this panel in five minutes. See you all soon. <laughs>